Hi there. In this video, I have the pleasure of sharing a bunch of great stories with you. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Cumulative Effects, the Stories of Our Lives There are many complex and scientific definitions of cumulative effects, and I'm not going to bore you with those. However, it's likely that you've heard the phrase, you are what you eat. Maybe your mum told you that when you were young and she wanted you to learn to eat healthfully. I think that it describes it pretty well, in a metaphorical way. For me, cumulative effects can be boiled down to the consequences of all our choices in combination with many factors or circumstances that we have little control over. We can look back through history and understand the consequences of choices that were made through time, and from that learn about cause and effect relationships. This is the notion of systems dynamics, the interaction of multiple components of a system to produce an outcome. Now all of this gets very complicated and boring fast if we dive deep into the details. However, human beings have devised an ingenious method to share this knowledge in a fun way. It's called storytelling. About half the stories I'm going to share today are my own. The other half emerged from work I have had the honour of being involved in with five communities of the Sequatmak Nation, also known as the Shuswap Nation situated in British Columbia, Canada. The five communities include the Skeetchison, Tecumloops, Adams Lake, Splatson, and Shuswap Bands. The work I am referring to is the development of an ELSI's cumulative effects model that we have been developing together as an important tool to be used in the creation of a Sequatmak land management framework. ELSI's, A-L-C-E-S, is an acronym that stands for a landscape cumulative effects simulator. This framework will help define the future Sequatmax story and it won't be what we typically refer to as the status quo or business as usual. The objective of this work is to develop planning guidance to manage the positive and negative cumulative effects in their traditional territory arising from human land use. They'll do this by first envisioning the future the nation wants identifying the key strategies that will take them there, and then assessing new development and land use opportunities within that context. This is a progressive approach to creating a desired future, rather than simply responding and mitigating the residual negative cumulative effects of individual projects. I am honored to be able to share this part of the story with you. Now, stories are an ancient art we use to connect ourselves to our past and to design our future. And while knowing where we have come from is very important, it is the imagining of our future which is both exciting and extremely valuable. Stories are the best way people communicate ideas, connect, build relationships, trust, share knowledge, grow understanding, entertain and inspire. And interestingly enough, I know that after watching this video, only about 5% of you will remember the statistics, but all of you will remember the stories. The First Nations of this area have handed down knowledge orally in stories through generations. The stories are always told at a level appropriate to the recipient. They reinforce connections to the land by using landmarks as reminders of the important learnings of the past and our vision of the future. Here we see one version of Sinclip, also known as Coyote, a prominent character in the legends of interior British Columbia First Nations. Stories about Coyote's adventures, mistakes, challenges, learned lessons, and his efforts to help his friends are etched in the landscape by the presence of Coyote rocks like this one, all across the territory. The stories remind us of our responsibilities and values. I'm going to share part of my story with you to show you why I'm so certain we need to be writing our own stories, starting with the end in mind, and not just letting the future happen to us. Now all good stories have three important parts. First, there is the setting. Once upon a time in a land far, far away. In the context of landscape cumulative effects, the setting is the current state of the landscape which is most often a watershed or a group of watersheds called a basin. And that landscape is made up of natural cover types like forests, 
as well as human footprint like cities and highways. Second, the drama in a story happens when change comes about. This is called the plot. In landscapes, change comes from two sources, Mother Nature, through natural disturbance like wildfire, and human disturbances like agriculture or energy development. The third important part of a good story is that it needs characters. These characters either drive or respond to change, and the relationships between these characters are often the most compelling part of the story. When we look at cumulative effects in watersheds, the characters are in three categories, economic, social, and environmental indicators. Scientists often refer to these as valued components. So here's part of my story. Once upon a time, I was 14 years old and growing up in Cold Lake, Alberta. As the setting goes, I was a happy and healthy kid, very active in sports, including ice hockey, soccer, golf, water skiing. I lived in a normal family, had good friends, and I was doing well in school. It was pretty great. My parents had bought some land at Crane Lake and we were building a cottage there. Then came change. One afternoon while working on our cottage, there was an accident. I fell off a stepladder into a pile of cut firewood where I had previously put a chisel we were using. I fell on the chisel and it pierced right through my left thigh, severing 60% of the sciatic nerve. I was really lucky. A millimeter or two over and it would have cut my artery and I would have probably bled to death in 30 seconds. I was medevac to Edmonton and after an eight hour operation where a very skilled neurosurgeon sewed my sciatic nerve back together through a microscope, I commenced physiotherapy diagnosed with a condition known as a drop foot. Now the standard story for cases like mine, given the technology and the injury, was as follows. I would be able to learn to walk again, but I would have a pronounced limp and require either a cane or to wear an ugly metal brace. I would never run or play running sports again. And when you're 14, you really don't want to stick out. But with my brace and my new walk, I felt like you could see me from a hundred miles away. And of course it felt like everyone stared. I thought they couldn't help it. I was so weird looking. So I had a choice. I could just accept this outcome and make the best of it. Or I could write my own story. With more than full support from my family, a few close friends, and my spiritual faith, I imagined a future where I was my active, healthy self again. No canes or braces, not held back at all. There were very many challenges and some things I could not overcome, but I did throw away the cane and the braces and I have lived Barry's story. I played competitive hockey, soccer, and golf. I learned to slalom water ski spent much of my career hiking all over British Columbia's mountains as a forester, and I am a four-time marathoner. I think the accident was a gift to me with a purpose. It gave me the opportunity to embrace change, to adapt and to set a course for a future I wanted instead of just letting business as usual happen to me. It also taught me the value of collaboration and support from others. This has been a tremendous guidance for me as I try to help others with progressive planning approaches to help them build their desired future. At the time I am recording this story, it is 2016. In British Columbia, the economy is the strongest in Canada and is forecasted to grow around 3%. And British Columbia's Premier, Clark, tells a story that she believes that the continuing trend of expanding British Columbia's resource extraction economy is crucial for achieving the goals of her government in the future. And her story is enhanced because much of the rest of Canada is struggling economically, and so she feels it is part of BC's role to make big contributions in terms of jobs and national revenues in Canada. From a cumulative effects perspective, this will bring many benefits on the economic side, but it also brings many simultaneous pressures on the natural landscape. And in British Columbia, as in many parts of the world, there has been a struggle between those in support of development and those in support of preservation. This struggle has often be, been seen as a tug of war with losers and winners. 
and this has created much conflict. A better way to view this story is to think of it as a delicate balance we are trying to achieve, which allows us to prosper today without compromising the ability of future generations to also prosper. So, in order to properly assess the cumulative effects of overlapping land uses and natural disturbance, it is very important that we examine both meaningful time and meaningful space. Meaningful time in North America means creating a baseline in our landscape of interest starting prior to the arrival of European explorers and settlers. Sometimes we refer to this time as pre-industrial. Then we need to track the changes in landscapes that have occurred as industrial land use has grown and developed with an ever-increasing human population. Understanding historical change, the magnitude, pattern, and sectors that made it happen is highly valuable knowledge. It provides a window into understanding the complexities of an integrated system and gives us a basis to forecast future conditions if the business-as-usual scenario, as illustrated by the last century as an example, is expected to continue. And looking forward, as we contemplate alternative land use scenarios, we have found through experience that 50 years is a reasonable time frame to look forward. While many natural values operate on a time scale much longer than this, the economy offers more risk and uncertainty and it becomes more difficult to anticipate developments in technology or resource demand. Meaningful space means that we examine our landscape relevant to each of the values we are interested in understanding more about. For example, if we are interested in learning about the Fraser River sockeye salmon, then it may be most relevant to consider the entire Fraser Basin, as well as corridors within the Salish Sea, because this species needs all of that space in order to complete its life cycle. On the other hand, if our focus is on the potential for tourism on Shuswap Lake, then perhaps the Shuswap Watershed is the appropriate spatial scale. So any tools that are looking at a range of values must be flexible enough to shift the spatial scale according to the value we are investigating. Recently I've been doing work with the Shuswap Roundtable looking at trails. When I started documenting all the factors that influence the integrity or enjoyment of trails by users, I found the list to be very long. Similarly, when I looked at how trails affect other values, it became very clear that the relationship of the characters of this story, trails and all other associated values, is very complex. And when you consider that trails are only one small part of the overall system within a watershed, we start to realize how difficult it can be to track all of these different interactions. In this slide, you are looking inside of the ALCES online model and seeing only a small portion of the relationships that are defined for a watershed. Without powerful computers and software, understanding the cumulative effects of all of those interactions would be extremely difficult. This is why I often use the ALCES Online suite of tools for this kind of work. I have been fortunate to be able to work directly with the developers of ALCES for 16 years now. In my opinion, ALCES Online is the best spatial cumulative effects simulator in the world. And I'm not alone. ALCES is being used around the world in Australia, India, and the United States, and broadly across Canada. The models do all the hard computational tasks it takes to keep track of billions of transactions in a simulation. It provides a convenient and fast way to visualize and compare a range of what-if scenarios and ultimately to tell good stories. The next three stories I'm going to share were developed by the Sequatmec using ALCES online tools. So remember that the plot of a story emanates from change. Each of these three stories has a different change agent. The first is something we call linear edge. Think of it as a cut or fragmentation in the natural vegetative cover of a landscape. An easy one for me to visualize is logging access roads built through the forest. The second story is one that looks at the potential implications of wildfire and climate change. And the third story examines a type of surface mining for aggregate that creates gravel pits. 
So let's start with linear edge. This is a very interesting and telling metric. The linear edge brings both negative and positive effects. On the negative side, linear edge, think logging roads, transmission lines, pipelines, creates a number of changes on the landscape that bring about changes in water dynamics, the access of predators and their efficiency in catching prey, it creates a vector for invasive noxious weeds, it provides access for humans which inevitably brings increased hunting, fishing and ATV activity and pressure on the landscape. Roads and trails also have the potential to detract from our viewscapes. However, linear edge also brings us many great values. Through improved access to natural resources, we are able to create significant economic benefits that result in more, more employment, higher gross domestic product, government revenues that pay for social services like health care and schools. Our quality of life is raised substantially through improved access to a wide range of goods and services, and our ability to get out and enjoy our vast landscapes is greatly increased. As an example, my wife Karen and I love to hike the beautiful backcountry of British Columbia, but we could not get to most of the places we go if we did not have that road access. Now, linear edge is not something that only affects humans. Many species of wildlife are significantly influenced by the density of linear edge in their habitat. In our first story, we're going to look at the implications of linear edge for our main character, the charismatic megafauna known affectionately in British Columbia as the grizzly bear. The map I am showing you was generated from the ALCES model. What you see is a heat map showing the relative distribution of linear edge across the province, not including trails. It may be difficult for you to read the legend, so I'll translate. So if you think back to my example of the logging road, one kilometer of logging road in one square kilometer of forest would result in one kilometer per square kilometer of linear edge density. On the map, as the colors move from yellow to red, the density of edge increases. Two numbers to think about in this first map are the areas colored yellow. They are representing areas at least 0.6 kilometers per square kilometer of linear edge. The red areas are twice that density or greater, where linear edge is at least 1.2 kilometers per square kilometer. As you can see, we have built a lot of roads. Only the highest mountaintops in the very far north are not roaded. In fact, there are about 840,000 kilometers of edge in British Columbia. Roughly 44% of the entire province is with, within 500 meters of linear edge. So what does that really look like? On this slide, I have zoomed into a typical landscape in the Shuswap watershed where I live. There's a lot of forest harvesting in these forests, and as you can see in the imagery below the color, there are a number of cut block roads leading to harvested areas. The square colored yellow is one that represents approximately 0.6 kilometers per square kilometer of linear edge. The squares colored red show us what 1.2 kilometers per square kilometer or higher looks like. So what does this mean? for our character, the grizzly bear. In 1999, the British Columbia Ministries of Forests, Environment, Lands and Parks suggested, based on research they had conducted, that 0.6 kilometers per square kilometer of linear edge is a maximum threshold for the long-term viability of the grizzly bear populations. That means that at a linear edge density higher than 0.6, it is unlikely that grizzly bear populations could persist in that area. They may be able to derive some benefit by spending short amounts of time in the area, but overall the habitat would be inadequate. In this slide we are looking at a major watershed in British Columbia known as the Columbia River Basin in 2010. And I have changed the color legend a little bit to help us understand the magnitude of linear edge density in this area. Yellow areas are still at that 0.6 kilometers per square kilometer threshold level or higher. 
But red areas are at least four times that amount at 2.4 kilometers per square kilometer or higher. You can see that very large amounts of the basin are currently well above the maximum linear edge density for grizzly bear population persistence. And in fact, we know that many populations of grizzly bears have already been extirpated from this area or are threatened, particularly in the south. And there is a clear linkage to linear edge density. In the Sequatmec model, all future land uses over the next 50 years based upon published development commitments or requirements, including the allowable annual cut for timber, as defined by British Columbia's Chief Forester, have been forecasted. As we can see, pretty much all of the valleys will be at or above the 0.6 kilometers per square kilometer threshold. And in fact, vast areas of this basin will be at or above a level four times the maximum threshold for grizzly bears. This is the very likely outcome of the business as usual scenario. But being able to use tools like the LC's model enables us to anticipate these unintended outcomes and look for options to manage and lessen the negative effects of our development plans. If we investigate further, we find out that more than 40% of the region exceeds the threshold only as a result of logging roads. There are probably a number of options we could choose to manage this. Shutting down the logging industry is not a viable option given that it contributes so much to the economy of this region. However, we also know that roads themselves that create this edge are not hazardous to the grizzly bears. The road does not rise up in the middle of the night and strangle them to death. It is actually the use and access of these roads by humans that is problematic. And so, a management strategy like access management to control the access and use of all of these roads by humans could serve to dramatically reduce the negative effects these roads would create. As I mentioned, there are many examples of things we could do, so this is not a doomsday story for the grizzly bear unless we choose to continue just doing what we've been doing. Our second story is one that has a plot driven by wildfire and climate change. The characters of the story are public safety, timber supply, and mountain caribou. During the process of building the Sequatmec models, we look back historically at how much of the landscape has been altered by wildfire. Around 1950, fire suppression in British Columbia was ramped up to a significant level. From that time forward, the BC Wildfire Branch has been extremely successful in reducing the amount of fires that burn every year by about 85% compared with how much it burned naturally in the decades and centuries before. In fact, crews are successful in containing 92% of all wildfires in British Columbia within the first 24 hours of their discovery. Now this is important because planning for safe communities like fire smarting, forecasting future timber supplies, and managing for old growth obligate wildlife species like mountain caribou all rely on estimates of how much the forest will be burned by wildfire every year. And all of these studies assume that the business as usual scenario will take place, that is to say suppression will remain highly effective. However, we have collectively come to realize that climate change is upon us. In a report that was recently completed by the British Columbia government looking at the likely change in fire rate and behavior in the southern interior of British Columbia as a result of climate change, significant changes in fire activity are forecasted. Fires are expected to double in size in the next 60 years. Fire severity up substantially and the seasons are getting longer. And this is further backed up by reports from the Insurance Bureau of Canada that predict the incidence of severe wildfire will increase in British Columbia by 50% or more by 2050. So it would seem that the business as usual scenario is unlikely. In this slide you see simulations of future fire using the ALCES model for this area. The red areas are the burned areas. On the left, you can see the business-as-usual forecast for a decade, 
and on the right you can see the natural fire rate in the absence of fire suppression. And as it turns out, the natural fire rate actually emulates what's likely to be happening in the future as a result of climate change, despite our efforts to put fires out. We have seen examples of this in other areas, especially in California and the northern boreal forests of central Canada. We can use the ALSI's cumulative effects simulator to understand the potential implications of this for our key characters. How will we change our fire smart tactics in order to protect communities in the future? Should we be accounting for the likely loss of timber volume from wildfire when we assess long-term timber supply forecasts? And given that the remaining amount of mountain caribou herd ranges are very small, how will we prevent the loss of the old forest in these areas that are so critical for the survival of that species? The third story is about surface mining and how the prominence of that sector is undergoing quite an internal change. Using the Sequatmec Elsie's model, we found a very interesting plot developing. Surface mining for coal and metals has long been a very important component of British Columbia's economy, and that is forecast to continue. These mines are very large projects and all undergo intensive environmental impact assessment studies before they are approved. However, there is another kind of surface mining that we do a lot of, and that is the mining of gravel. We use a tremendous amount of gravel, or aggregate, for the building and maintaining of our communities and transportation infrastructure. Not including gravel that is used on logging roads, which is a lot, according to the BC aggregate producers, the per capita rate of consumption for every man, woman and child in British Columbia is approximately one gravel truck load full of gravel per year. That's used to build our hospitals, schools, basements, sidewalks, parking lots, roads, etc. So we used the ALSI's model to forecast gravel demand forward based on population growth estimates derived by British Columbia statistics. And it turns out that the demand for aggregate is increasing at a much faster rate than the demand for coal and metals. And by 2050, the area occupied by gravel pits will exceed that of surface mines for metals and very nearly exceed the area of coal mines. And perhaps more interesting than that is that gravel pits are small and so typically do not receive an environmental impact assessment. And yet, they are likely to become the largest open pit mines in the province. In this slide, you can see the spatial distribution of surface mines forecasted for 2060 in the southeastern portion of British Columbia. In the lower side, you will see that 30 coal and metal mines are forecast to be on the landscape. And you can see that individually some of them are quite large. However, in the top side, you can see about 357 large-scale gravel pits will be in operation or already developed. While they are small compared to the other traditional mines, they will still occupy a significant portion of the landscape. While gravel has become a very important commodity for our high standard of living, the widespread spatial distribution of gravel pits needed to support this across many watersheds will likely have many negative cumulative effects for water quality and fish. I've only shown a few ways we can display information in the ALSI's model. It can also be shown in 3D maps, 4D scatter graphs and charts, and linked to visual and audio media like movies and photographs. And we only need to look to Hollywood to understand how powerful movies can be. I will explore these options in other videos. For now, let me invite you to explore with me how the LC suite of tools can help you write your story and tell it. For a personalized online demonstration, contact me and we'll set that up. In the meantime, I hope you will follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Snapchat. Have a great day and thanks for watching.